Guru Nation, thank you so much for coming on. And make sure you like, subscribe, comment, share. If you're listening on the podcast, do the same. We got a very special episode today. Uh, one of my sponsors, Creo. So we have Raymond Omizu, the founder of Creo, co-founder and CEO of Creo. And then Dr. Joy Bosice, CEO and founder of Pluto Health. They have an announcement to make, but this is like a conversation we're going to, because I, I really think this is where the industry is headed. We have a bunch of data everywhere. It's all siloed, right? And in research, it'd be nice to have access to this data. I mean, we know it's out there. So how do we get it? And so Dr. Joy created a very interesting company with Pluto Health, and it addresses these concerns. And she's also an MD, MPH physician uh, who is a health tech founder, which it's to me, it's always interesting when a physician goes out and starts a tech company in the te- in in the healthcare industry because it means most likely they are scratching their own itch which i think very similar to raymond raymond started creo because he scratched his own itch so and i started my site network because we scratch our own itch so all three of us here like have a lot of similarities in in the companies we started so thank you so much both of you for being on thank you always thank a you. pleasure thanks for having us and Dr. Joy, let's get started with you just really quickly. Um, I just recently connected with you on LinkedIn, but for those that don't know, myself included, like I'm not too familiar with your background. Can you kind of just walk us through your origin story, maybe? Sure, sure. I mean, from infancy or <laughs> academia? Uh, let's say like med school on. Okay. Um, Well, I would say in general, I'm a physician who cares a lot about health equity and trying to level set the playing field for everyone out there. So um, I studied anthropology in college, became pretty obsessed with learning patterns of human behavior to try to access healthcare, Um, and then uh, did my public health degree at Yale, uh, studied global health management went to med school, was in the Global Health Scholars Program, was totally on the track to, you know, live and breathe global health day in, day out until I encountered technology in the field. So I got first introduced to health tech while working in um, Tanzania uh, while in medical school. Uh, we were essentially tasked to build what I would say is an early mobile EMR at the time right when the iPhone came out. <laughs> so that was like wow. 2008, 2009. So like early, early days, which was a really neat experience because I was able to see firsthand how powerful mobile can be and distributing information and sharing information at scale, no matter where you are, um, hospital or not, or um, you know, in the field. So it became a pretty powerful tool. Um, from there, I had the privilege of uh, doing my medicine residency at Duke University, where I'm currently an assistant professor for hospital medicine. So I'm a hospital medicine doctor. Um, But prior to starting Pluto, I was uh, chief of digital health and strategy um, and also associate director at uh, Duke Innovations and Health, which was a company that was co-founded by, or a group co-founded by McKinsey and Company in the World Economic Forum, looking at innovations in healthcare and how to scale them. Wow. I also noticed on LinkedIn, you worked for the World Health Organization. So you understand big data, massive scale health outcomes. <laughs> but, so how did Pluto Health, like when was the idea born for Pluto Health and what kind of problem were you running into that you just thought, you know what, there's got to be a better way? Yeah, I mean, I think it's always been a problem in trying to coordinate care between entities. You acutely feel it when you're practicing medicine and you don't have enough records on a patient. You can't make the best decisions because you just don't have that information and say a patient is sick in front of you, which you often see in the hospital. They can't recall things. They have a fever, they're septic, et cetera. So it's a huge problem and you you see how valuable it is to get access to that information um, over time. It's safer for patients, it's better for families. It saves money, time, and heartache. Um, I would say that I first started thinking about Pluto 
um, when we were thinking through uh, how to engage and support patients through time, um, specifically in the clinical trial space. So mm -hmm. while I was at Duke, we were thinking through how can we be meaningful for patients over time? How do we think beyond the fact that they are more than just this one trial that they are trying to screen in for and they their experience lives beyond when a trial ends. So how can we be meaningful for them, period? So that's our stance at Pluto is we try to take care of the person first, honor that care journey, be supportive through them either before, during, or after a trial. So that's how uh, we are built is to to think through how to be supportive over time. Was it was it inspired by the inefficiencies at academia or were you considering private industry as well? Um, I I would say I I think the inefficiencies are shared between both industry and academia. It's just simply put a struggle bus to get medical records and information on a patient. Yes. Um, it's, it's especially hard when they're sick, right? So it, so I think it's our job to try to do as much as we can and relieve that burden away from, uh, from patients or participants, right? When they're mm -hmm. um, thinking through a trial. And then how, how did you decide, Hey, you know what? The timing is right now. Like I'm not too familiar with EMRs and how they consolidated, but I would imagine it started out when I think it was the Obama administration, right? When they were incentivizing physicians to go digital. And that's when I remember like working at my site, all the doctors were like, all right, let's do the EMR. Let's switch to EMR. Over time, did that consolidate to just like a few big players or how did that work out? Yeah. So I would say that it's all about timing, right? So as, as things became more digitized, we started recognizing the value of having things electronic. Um, and so um, not only that, it is the standardization of data in certain formats over time that became more widely adopted across different health centers that helped this. So in the early days, just having an EMR on its own really wasn't enough because, you know, trying to send data from one place to another place is very difficult as, as we've experienced, or we speak just different languages, if you will, in the data realm. But over time, I would say, you know, circa 210s and beyond now or in the 2020s, there's been growing recognition to standardize more and more formats so that we can more efficiently communicate. And the, this kind of parallels what's happening now in clinical research. I mean, I think like clinical research is always a decade behind what's happening in healthcare um, from my observations. Raymond, you and Raymond know this oh, way better than I do. Absolutely. I, I like to tell people Creo eSource is like in EMR for clinical research, you know? <laughs> yeah. And what is it uh, like only like not even 10% of sites adopt eSource of any kind, not just Creo. Uh, I, but think, I think we're past that now, fortunately, but uh, yeah, okay. it, it, um, yeah, I, I, I think we're up to like 20% in the United States. Okay. Um, no, no, there's no perfect database, but that's our best guess. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, clinical research has historically been, I would say, 20 years behind other industries. So I think a lot of what we do at Creo is look at how technology operates in other industries and then just import those same concepts into research. Yeah, um, like so research is one of the easiest industries to predict because you just look at what's happening outside of research <laughs> 10 years ago and that's that's your blueprint right i remember when emrs came out this was like during obama administration they were incentivizing all doctors they switch over a bunch of them were complaining it was a lot of similarities mm -hmm. to like hey go to esource yeah but now you go in a doctor's i mean who's there's no doctor i know of that still has paper charts there's one guy in my town. He's like 90 years old, ophthalmologist. So I understand why he hasn't switched, but no one else <laughs> really like everyone uses the EMRs. Yeah. And what I've noticing is a lot of new clinical research sites start off with eSource. Um, That's right. Not with paper. Yep. So was it easier, Dr. Joy? Were you waiting? Like, did you always have this idea? And were you just waiting for consolidation at the EMR level? to make this easier to integrate everything? 
or and can you kind of give us an overview of the landscape of EMRs today? Like how many big players are there? Like what approximately what percentage of records in the US are from like Oh sure. Yeah, yeah. So so I would say that well there's there's two parts to your question. So the first is that I didn't think I would be working on Pluto, you know, seven years ago. So this is more recent, but I think it's because of where the tech and the industry is today and the regulations that make what we do today possible. Um, I would say generally the landscape is, if we are talking about the medical record landscape, there are it, the two biggest giants are Epic and Cerner, right? In the, uh, who basically are the electronic health systems for many, many, um, many, clinics and hospitals Would, does e-clinical works fall into one of those buckets or is that like a mm -hmm. that's who my yep. doctor uses e okay yep yeah that's a common outpatient um one so yeah um i would say that that is it's generally been a, a good trend for adoption i think the promise of it is great like it it helps with some efficiencies but there are other times where it it is pretty inefficient because there's so much charting and clicking through different things. Um, so you said Epic and what was the other one? Cerner? Cerner. So those mm -hmm. two brands own a bunch of smaller brands underneath it, right? Like eClinical Works is one of them or how does um, that work? I'm not quite sure because the acquisition landscape changes all the time, but um, those are the two main uh, market movers in that space. Okay. I, I think they have most of the hospitals and major health systems. And I think um, some of the like more outpatient physician practices will go for more affordable EMR systems. Okay. So like okay. the eClinical Works, Athena Health, you know, I think there's a bunch of them. Okay. Yeah, I think between the two, Epic and Cerner, um, I'm looking at some stats. They they are a little over 50% of the market share, at least in the hospital setting. I see. And uh, so, Cerner, for the record, is actually in the clinical research space. Um, I don't think they made an investment in Elego. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. okay. And I think they're owned by Oracle, which also has a clinical trust suite. <laughs> Oracle does even the EDC. I know I have a study with Oracle EDC. Um, so how did they create, how did you meet Ray? Or how did you guys meet each other? Maybe Ray met Dr. Joy. Where did you guys <laughs> hook up? I think was it through a mutual investor? I think it, it was some. Um... I think so. Gosh, I think it was. Was it through Jess or Dana? I can't remember which. Yeah, one. it was um Boston Millennium Partners is a investor in Creo and also uh -huh. one of their investors. Or I gotta learn from these investors. You got it. The magic's in connecting people. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. they probably saw like a natural fit, like, hey, Raymond's gaining traction with the sites. There's a lot of sites. There's probably, I don't know, two or three main e-source platforms now, um, I'm, I would guess. And so there's a lot of similarities. And somebody saw this and said, hey, why don't you talk to Dr. Joy or Dr. Joy talk to Ray about maybe bringing this to clinical research? Because this is a challenge for sites, right? We... Luckily, at my site, we get most of our records from our private practice. But every now and then, we get a patient coming from outside of the clinic, and we have a hard time getting their records. We have our own intake form uh, because we kind of assume we're not going to get the records if they come from outside. So we just we have to have something on paper. So, hey, fill this out. Bring your medications with you. At least we get major diagnosis, major like allergies, uh, medical history, condiments, current condiments, like just at least to capture something. That's the process we're currently doing. That takes a lot of time uh, for a, from a screening visit. That's a good half an hour, if mm -hmm. not longer. So this would be, I mean, I'm already thinking like if I just got the records because of Pluto Creo integration in my visit one screen, First of all, let's rewind and go back to how this actually works. Yeah, so if you're like most research sites, if the patient is not a part of the practice you're affiliated with or has important records that are not part of the practice, and this could be with specialists all the time, right? The PCP's records are critical. 
the process right now is extremely cumbersome, right? I'm guessing, you know, get a hard copy wedding signature in the release, send the fax into some number, wait, wait, make a phone call, wait, maybe it comes in the mail three weeks later. You've already done a bunch of screening procedures and then discover something and wow, maybe they're disqualified from the study and, and could have saved two weeks worth of time, right? <laughs> so with this integration, we're basically uh, allowing Creo clients to um, leverage uh, Pluto Health's reach through the health information exchanges. So essentially, um, as a site, you still need the patient's release. You always need that. So you'd obtain the patient's consent form, which can be done outside of Creo or actually inside Creo with our e-consent uh, platform, even remotely. So get the release and then um, submit the demographic information for the patient. And then our system will then request the um, basically the entire patient care journey from Pluto Health. And I, I'd say we're, you know, so far on beta testing, you know, we're getting it more often than not because most patients are in a health system that participates in one of the common health information exchanges. So I think it's about 85, 90% population reach. Is that right, Joy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where I, I was trying to get at the number. 85 to 90 of the population data is in one of these two <laughs> exchanges. Right. And we put a link inside the Creo app that takes you to a page on Pluto's website where they maintain a list of the institutions that are participating. So if you know the institution um, that, that your patient is getting healthcare at, you can see if they're on the list just to see if, you know, there's a good chance that you'll be able to retrieve the records or not. But most, because of the acquisitions now, most practices are part of a health system um, and most major health systems participate. Wow. So, okay, let's say I use the Creo e-consent, but let's say we're using a paper consent and we upload sure. it to Creo. And it, most of the consents now have the authorization to release records built in. Uh, if they don't, we have our own anyways that we give them and yeah. we upload it. How does that work? Because it's like a physical document uploaded. Do you, Creo like scan scan it for that wording or? Oh, you're talking like, about the medical release form itself? Yeah. Like how does oh. the magic happen? Like if it's paper, because if it's e-consent, I kind of understand it. But if it's paper. Well, if it's a medical release form on paper you would just obtain that night normally. If you want to upload to Creo, you can, um, because we have that functionality. If you don't want to, you don't have to, I guess. It's, I mean, it's your document, right? It's, mm. I guess, technically part of the study record to evidence that the medical right. records for that study were obtained properly. So you've got that, right? Um, and then once you have that, you would then need the system, uh, use Creo to generate the request. I see. I'm guessing, I'm, I'm trying to ask, like, what if the site didn't collect the authorization properly, but they still request the records? Like, how does Creo know that it was done the right way? Because that's almost it's, like a monitoring activity. No, it, yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's a responsibility of the site to obtain medical records. I mean, this this is um, the the integration is meant to be uh, a great convenient way for the site to you know use this platform. It's not. Yeah, you know, it's not meant to do every aspect of I mean, ultimately the sites are responsible for all aspects yeah. <laughs> of patient consent, et cetera. Yeah, I see. Uh it's super interesting because the deliverable is the record, and then there's parameters you could pick as a site because as we know, like you <laughs> it's hit or miss with these medical records. You can either get like a thousand pages faxed back to you or nothing. Um Ideally, it's hits the sweet spot where it gives you like the basics that you need, right? Current meds, medical history, allergies, things like that. Um, you the site has control over what they're actually requesting, right? We let the site choose the types of records that they want, um, because a lot of the records may not be relevant for that trial, um, and you're right, it can be overwhelming, um, sort of data overload to get the full thousand pages. Um, so we do let the site say, I want these types of medical records for this particular subject or at the study level, this particular study, we should you know, make sure that we get these kinds of records so you can check them off. That's so cool. I think the next, the next step, I also wanna get into like other things Pluto Health does just to understand the business model better, but 
I mean, I could already see this eventually automatically populating your source. Oh, I mean, this yes. is just this is just the beginning. Next, Next. yes, the first version <laughs> of this, we will we'll take the records and then provide it provide, provide it to the site essentially as a PDF, um, which is you know the current experience for the site. Um, but as you know, in, in Creo, you know, if, it, if it's a PDF in, within the Creo system, you have the ability to annotate, redact, mark up, whatever, um, and then and then sign it. And then when you sign it, you're sort of publishing it to source. So one of the things that I think is critical is, you know, when the, meta, when the records come in, it's not like it's officially part of source right away, because we do recognize that the site has to um, review the source, review the medical records, reconcile it. You know, there has to be some sort of proper review period, right, by the investigator. You don't just want it right into the source for the monitors to look at. Like, you wouldn't want that. You want the ability to have, you know, a workspace. So, and that's a big reason of how we built all of Creo resources. There's always, like, a period of time where the site can say, okay, I want to make sure this is correct before I'm submitting. And once you submit, the audit trail is turned on, right? And then it keeps track of all changes and deletions after that. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm... A big fan of Creo is like it really gives the site the flexibility uh, to do with the data as they wish and whatever works best for them. They're not Creo is not trying to change the way you do business as a site. They're just giving you options to do it better. Right. Is probably the best way I can explain it. Um, it's interesting to see though how the job of a CRC is evolving. Because we're like data, almost like a data manager at some point, you know, with the e pros. And I was on a study, just I am on a study right now where daily diaries, right? If you're asleep at the wheel as a CRC, you're missing important stuff. And like it's like a paradigm shift to understand that these diaries are source. You yeah. <laughs> it's, it's interesting how this. Industry is evolving. Uh, Dr. Joy, as far as Pluto Health is concerned, what um, is it mainly in the clinical research space or are you guys all across healthcare right now with the service offerings? Yeah, I would say um, going back to the patient first approach is it's our job to be relevant and helpful for a patient through all aspects of their lives, whether they're participating in a trial or not. So um, we do a lot of health services um, things like with patients. I'll say patients now, since we're not talking about research per se, we would traditionally call them participants. Um, so I would say that at the very heart of what we do, it's figuring out what somebody needs um, and trying to address that need. So it may or may not be access to a trial. It may be, hey, you're missing your immunizations or, hey, it looks like you're behind on your age appropriate cancer screenings, things like that. Mm. And um, so we will help close the loop on that. Um, our team can do things like deliver uh, testing and screenings to the doorstep sometimes, um, wow. other times through our other partners. So it just really depends on, on who we're working it with and what health campaign we're doing. An example of what we're working on uh, most recent working on now that I'm really excited about is running um, a lung cancer prevention uh, campaign. So it's all about trying to screen patients or for lung cancer. So you qualify if you um, have smoked a certain number of years and, and have these other criteria you meet. So mm. um, it's really fun. And I'm working with one of the, the, the retail groups on that. And so it's direct, like a lot of it is the, the direct patient interaction, patient uh, facing material and engagements. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think that, well, I would say the easiest way to think about us is we are your preventive health team in the background and or in the front. It just depends on the workflow of who we're working with. I see. Mm -hmm. You know, this get, this has me thinking about the future of research. So I was recently doing a study where it was very difficult to enroll. We tried 
everyone's screen fail. This study had 55 exclusion criteria. And the sponsor that's came. <laughs> sadly. What's that? That's not that, that uncommon, sadly. That's exactly right. Exactly. This is where I'm headed. So a sponsor came through with a central ad campaign, but they used a vendor. I guess I can name them. One N Health. Um, they don't sponsor anything. I, this is my only interaction with them. They saved the study for our site. I've never had a central ad campaign like vendor work before, mm -hmm. like to this degree. So it got me thinking 10 years from now with things like Pluto Health. I mean, you guys are, seem to be headed down this path too. I think patient leads coming to sites will almost be passive because we're we're getting like the leads now. That's great to hear. And I've always believed that to some degree, you could decouple a little bit the recruitment aspect from the operational aspect, right? Because as a site, if you have a qualified patient, you know, sites are good at what they do, right? They know how to do that part. But your database reaches, you know, finite. So with much more sophisticated advertising and with the empowerment of patients to control the medical records, right, there can be a lot more intelligent eligibility matching done outside of a site. Um, and so, you know, I envision a world where you could have recruitment firms such as One on Health and others, you know, do their, you know, mine the EMR systems or reach patients through marketing or ad campaigns, use a system like ours in partnership with Pluto Health to obtain medical records on the phone while the patient's there, exactly. really thoroughly screen them, which increases the accuracy of it, then take those pre-qualified high quality leads send them into the Creo system through our open API so that as a site, you just get the leads digitally, come pre-qualified. Maybe a lot of the, the traits and everything will become populated, right? And then obviously there'll probably be another, I mean, that's sort of incoming, there'll obviously be an investigator overseeing all this and making sure it's accurate, but you can literally create a, a digital pipeline, right? With medical records into this recruitment platform, directly into Creo, which as you know, will come in as a patient, you make them a subject in the study. The e-source will pre-populate with what's in the patient profile with their traits and medications. It's a feature that we have. And then and then from there, you, you go into the actual study itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Pluto Health, I mean, yeah, they could be the workhorse behind this. Like we could theoretically use, if this was out, we could use all these 1N health patients are, well, actually, interestingly enough, half of them <laughs> were from our own practice and we couldn't find them in our database, which is all another podcast. Sure. But the ones that were from outside, Pluto Health would definitely like be the engine to drive. Hey, like we're missing the records. But Pluto Health actually could also do the initial reaching out to the patients, which to me is like super powerful for what you guys do. You're very versatile in what you've built, uh, Dr. Joy, because of that patient interaction besides the data itself yeah i would expand it and say it's more than just data or a one-time exchange interaction for a trial like it's our job to have a relationship that's relevant for the patient over time um and i would say that that generally is what the industry has been trying to strive for over the years right just we always talk about the patient journey or like, you know, I kind of say that facetiously, but I feel like there have been workshops on this. But if you just take a step back and ask yourself, have we really been innovating in a way that makes sense for the patient and not the trial? Um, I would say that we are far behind. And so what's really exciting is that if we think about engaging in patient throughout their lives, there's so many opportunities to reach out to them over time for, I would say, different interventions, whether it be preventive health, can appropriate cancer screening, or a uh, clinical trial when it makes sense. I think it's also really important to think through that because as we all know, many patients more often than not will fail to screen into a trial. So what happens to those patients over time, right? Like you don't want folks who are hoping to get into a trial to get, I would say, screening fatigue over time. So the whole point is, is like 
how how can we give people a value add um so yeah there was i don't know if you guys remember this was like so long ago it's probably safe to mention but and i don't even remember the name but ikevia bought this patient guard was it raymond something like the idea was there was this this uh app that patients could upload the medications they're taking and it would safety check for like possible contraindications for the patient. So it was like patient facing mm-hmm. like, hey, be careful when you interact this with this. It's things your pharmacist is supposed to do, but often just fall through the cracks. Ikevia acquired this. And the idea was because they have all this data, right? It's very similar to Pluto Health in a way. Like they have all this data now. Uh, they can essentially funnel patients to their studies, but it mm-hmm. didn't work. Well, I don't know why it didn't work. Someone should do a case study on it. I don't even know the name, but this idea was there over a decade ago, but it obviously hasn't been like fully executed upon or perfected. And and to your point, Dr. Joy, like there's a lot that we're missing in this patient journey as as vendors that are <laughs> making patient centric tools, right? And services. So it's just something interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a number of reasons. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the company that you mentioned, but I think part of it is just innovating around the experience, like making things as easy as possible for the patient or participant, right? Like, so I'm going to guess if they had to upload all of their medications, like who does that? Right. I, don't, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> like, who, who? I mean, especially if you're sick, right? So it's, it's hard. Um, What I find really exciting about our partnership with Creo is that we're merging the two worlds when it makes sense for someone and making it really easy for them. Um, And so that's that's the fun part is Mm. just thinking, how do we streamline all all those crazy friction points? I mean, granted that there will always be some that we'll continue to innovate around, but like, how do we make it as easy as possible for them to participate? Um, I think it is the most important thing about what we're building here. Yeah. I think this partnership's maybe just the beginning of something potentially major. I, like, have you guys given much thought to the ePro, <laughs> ePro explosion that's happening? Like, like daily diaries. It's, we dodged a big bullet. Like, there's uh, so other sites on this study. It's a nightmare. The deviations they have. We we had like a few, but it's a potentially serious thing that i don't think the industry has thought through well like there's a lot of more data now coordinator and cras can't be asleep at the wheel yeah we we're i mean i think for, from creole's perspective we're going to pursue a strategy of interoperability and work with other vendors and certainly epo is on that list so we're we're actually hoping to get a pilot going with any pro vendor um, so that we can exchange information. But I think one of the things that's really critical is that the site needs to get alerted about those events. So you're talking about, I assume you're talking about like a daily compliance. And if there's non-compliance, then the site is expected to follow up, right? A little um, deeper than that. And so so I, it's like, that's one thing, but the, the more complicated aspect is if what they're putting in that diary is not allowed in the protocol so like you had patients doing this they should have been dropped out or they should at least been talked to i mean if it happens hundreds of times before someone wakes up and realizes what's going on you got a major problem right yeah yeah well i i assume the b pro vendor would be charged with notifying the (laughs) site that there's a discontinuation risk or you would think risk, um, the problem is like everyone just says, okay, well, CRC can figure it out. And CRO says, oh, yeah, the CRA can figure it out. So it just the two workhorses in this industry are just given way more, way more duties, like almost overnight. Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. I mean, you really need <laughs> the automation to at least flag that. Yes. Um, and then you need the flags to go into a system like Creo. I mean, that's really a long-term answer because here's the thing, like you've got a bunch of studies at your site, you've got coordinators there, but you don't get notified and you're, you're managing the site or somebody 
your team is a manager, but they're not actually in the EPRO, but they're managing the study team responsible for doing that, but they're not being notified of these alerts, right? So the, one of the core problems in this industry is that sponsors are hoping that the sites will provide oversight over all aspects of the trial, but guess what? They're not giving the management teams of these sites visibility or transparency into what needs to be done. So I've never seen an industry where, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a customer and I hire a vendor, I have my KPIs, but I'm going to hold it secret from the vendor. Like, yeah. why would sp sponsors want to know why sites aren't following up, right? Because now if you're a site director and you've got a management structure in place, you're 100% reliant on the frontline employees to be extremely conscientious. And that doesn't work that way. You have to have transparency um, so that as a site, you know what you're being measured by. And um, that transparency, that scorecard should be visible to the management team of the site, even if they're not individually on the delegation log of the study. That's a huge problem in this industry. That's a whole separate topic, but it's absolutely something that you know has to be solved. Dr. Dro, you were gonna say something. Oh no, I was just ag agreeing a lot with uh, Raymond. I think we've gotta figure out I would say the workflows and chain of commands between the site, the sponsor, and yeah. like, reasonable with the patient as well or participant. That's the next challenge because all these innovation, like, I mean, your guys' partnerships, perfect example. And I, I know Creo, I trust Creo enough to where I know it's going to be manageable for the site. Like, they don't just do things without thinking very hard about how the site's going to actually use it because Ray was a site owner for a long time. Um, so I'm just curious, Dr. Joy, what have sponsor, have you had discussions with sponsors about your offerings and what are they, if so, like, are they interested in like certain aspects or are you surprised with anything they are interested in? Um, I mean, uh, we've, we, when we engage, I guess define sponsor. <laughs> it like, depends on who. Like someone um, running a study, like, um, like a drug company that's planning a study hmm. or looking for feasibility maybe, or, or for patients, like a patient archetype for their new study they're designing. Yeah. So I would say um, for us, it's really just thinking through what av avenue or entry point we're talking about. Is it um, a campaign to get people to, you know, screen for something? Is it enrollment into a trial, things like that? But generally where we sit on the side of the house is we're more of an adjunctive um, platform or if you will, a uh, company to help augment capabilities. Like we don't run a study, if you will, and we don't approach them as this honeypot of data, which is not what we want to be known for. We want to be known for how we can support patients throughout their life. Um, you know, patients do have to share their data, uh, but our primary focus is just being supportive for them. Um, so generally, it's been the patient advocacy groups, the recruitment groups, the safety monitoring groups. There are things that we could do to support patients throughout a trial as well. So think through like, if you're in a clinical trial for specific malignancy, right? You want to be in the best shape of your life to get through this trial and the treatment. So we've got a, we've got to do our job to make sure that you're up to date on all of your health screenings and taken care of. Um, and so, you know, there's there's this component of making sure that we are putting the best foot forward to continue and and gain benefits from being in the trial. And I could see how that could help retention if if we could figure out, <laughs> which is one of the biggest issues with research is, okay, screen and randomize, but can you retain them and how how much longer can you retain them? And I mean, to some extent, Creo is involved in that. They have the, the patient outreach, um, the texting service. Uh, we haven't used that part yet, Ray, so I don't, I'm not experienced enough, but I can certainly see how as you scale a site and as a study starts getting more accrual, 
it becomes more difficult to manage the retention uh, from a site perspective. So it's good to know that there's groups out there that are working on solving these problems. That's pretty cool. There's a lot that's going to be changed in our industry. And I think this is like a perfect example of one like this. I used to hate three faxes and three phone calls. That's it. And that's all I did. Three fax, three <laughs> phone calls. I knew I was never going to get a record. But hey, yeah. let me just do it. And I don't want to <laughs> lie. So I, I don't I want to sleep at night. So let me actually do it and just document it. And that's it. Um, But now you don't have to deal with this. <laughs> it's just automatically done. I just think about if there's an adverse event or a serious adverse event. I mean, you have to obtain medical records, right? Yeah. If you had a medical release from the patient that, you know, had a certain time period like commensurate with the study i mean you could use this service that's available here to obtain medical records i mean that's the you know the patient safety value pop is huge yeah huge value add we didn't even discuss the saes yeah we just had a ae of someone we had to get medical records and luckily we got lucky we got it right away but we got it through the patient we we asked the patient Hey, bring a copy of your records because it's gonna be yes. impossible for us to get it. Isn't yeah. that <laughs> yeah, more burden like, for the patient? It's so it's such and, a frustration for people. It's just like I don't even understand. I don't even understand why that happens still, but it happened. The hospitals and, and take care lucky. of us. Yeah, I mean a lot of patients don't have like they don't a lot of patients don't necessarily know how to obtain their records. I mean it's not it's not an easier obvious thing right um for, for patients to do yeah you gotta ask like we're all patients you know this is why these things are like from an academic perspective the answers are di like the strategies are different from what you know would work on yourself <laughs> like i see right. a doctor like everyone else i ask them hey can i have a copy of my most recent lab results well you can tell they're not used to anyone doing that because it took like 10 minutes. People are like fumbling around. Which ones do you need? Oh, why do you need them? <laughs> well, I just want to have them like, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Here you go. But like the majority of patients don't do that. And the majority of providers are not, they don't have a system for how to give records to people randomly, even if it's yourself, right. <laughs> the patient. And a lot of patients have their records split in different health systems too. I don't think that that's not that unusual, right? So um, this service will actually do the aggregation for you, which is fantastic. Um, and another benefit, the way we built this out is, you know, real world, you have snowbirds. So you might have people, you're in like Arizona, I think, right? Or, yeah. yeah, so you might have people that are in the north for the winter and they come down, right? So our system will actually um, allow you to submit uh, multiple addresses for a patient. Mm -hmm. So imagine if they were back home in the Northeast and they had some kind of an emergency. Now, now and then they went to the nearest emergency room. Well, the emergency room is part of the hospital. It's probably part of the health information exchange, but it, it may not be that particular release form with a normal PCP, right? Right. So this is a way to get those, get access to those records pretty quickly. Well, I would say that it it's also like important so we encounter this in clinical, I actually was on, on clinical service um, yesterday and, and over the weekend, but you encounter people who move, right? So if you move from one state to another, like I'm from California, but I live in North Carolina right now, right? And so it's a big problem, especially if you think about people who access clinical trials, like say you are a patient from California, but you're presenting to MD Anderson for a clinical trial in Texas, like huge problem if you get part of your care in different states. I think another component that is important is not just getting the records themselves. Like I can't tell you how many times I've, even when we're lucky and get those faxes, right, that come through, um, you'll have a pile, we literally get piles of patient records, like a record this thick, right? And when you're a busy, uh, you have a very busy team, you can't dig through all of it and meaningfully take care of the patient on time. They're literally crashing in front of you and you have a stack of data that's just sitting there. 
Um, and so you've got to figure out a better flow. So I would say getting data is just step one, right? You've got to curate it and organize it and make sure that is what's relevant is floated to the top immediately. And so like, that's essentially also what we do at Pluto. It's in order to be clinically relevant, we've got to organize a timeline and figure out what's going on. Um, so it's not just piles of data. And Raymond, I hope you appreciate that. But, <laughs> um, oh, but I, you're, you're normalizing a lot of the data too, right? Because yeah, a lot of yeah. institutions will use different fields for the same, yeah. the same thing. And we organize it and we have to do that if we have, we are trying to figure out what a patient needs. Like, did you go, I'll use Duke and UNC for an example, because they're our tribals. Um, but did you go get a colonoscopy at UNC and your primary care is at Duke? Like, if I don't organize that in a timeline, I can't do my job as Pluto to figure out if you truly have a healthcare gap or not. So our job is to handle the data. Hmm. Uh, I mean, step one, but yes, that's one of many requirements to do our job. And this used to all be, hum well, still is human labor that's slowly becoming automated and aggregated. Like you said, the collection of the data is just the first step, but there's a lot of actual work, man hours that go into yeah. the curating. I mean, there's entire professions that, that do nothing but this. Yeah. Interesting stuff. We all live in the future, just not evenly distributed yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think this is the beginning. I mean, I think that what we're working together now is the first part of a long-term journey towards, you know, truly integrating clinical research and Right. In healthcare. I mean, and we've been talking about like, that for years. That's what I like about Creo. And that, I mean, people are going to say, oh, well, they're sponsoring you. That's why. No, I I was a user before sponsorship. Like, Creo truly understands, and they're always looking to innovate, like, anticipate what's the problem. It's like, Raymond knows problems like there's people in this industry i already know like 10 years down the road like this is most likely going to be an issue how do we start solving these things now and like this pluto partnerships like perfect example it's probably a few years in the making if i had to guess maybe not things happen quick now but point is you want to you want service providers now that you can trust and they're not just thinking about how to please their vc partners you know <laughs> so that's my little Wait, no, spiel. nobody asked for this nobody actually asked for this innovation or enhancement or whatever you want to call it um but i think you know in a couple of years from now i'm hoping people look at this and this becomes part of the expectation set interesting so ah. no none of your sites asked for this you just audible it and said hey you know what i would want this so let's do it if yes correct i mean i our sites give us plenty of feedback and obviously yeah. that is a huge part of what guides their roadmap. But a lot of the requests we get are anchored off of what the current technology solutions are capable of doing. No one really thinks about the other problems that could be solved by technology. Um, just because it doesn't, they don't think of that as something that they could ask the software vendor to solve, right? Um, but I think what's what's been happening now is this trend towards more sort of patient centricity and controlling their medical records. Um, I think that's hopefully we continue to go in that direction from a policy perspective. Um, and I think that's just gonna you know, open up all kinds of possibilities. I see. And Dr. Joy, from the perspective of your end of the partnership, it's everything's to enhance the patient journey to make life a little easier for the patient. So I'm guessing that Creo alerts you of studies because Creo's the e-source platform and for, for a lot of trials, you get access to the data that, hey, this might be an appropriate study for this patient, or am I looking too far ahead? I mean, that would be ideal. I'll have Raymond answer this since you are, you know, <laughs> the platform owner. Yeah, I don't think that's that's currently how we're um, operating now, um, but anything's possible. Can, that's the thing, yeah. Certainly. 
I figured it out. I mean, all, all the clinical research um, trials that are enrolling are all on clinicaltrials.gov. I mean, anyone can go use their API and and um, download all the eligibility criteria. Yeah, yeah. So I think the magic, I think there's so many things that partnerships like this can potentially unlock that we haven't even thought of the beginnings of the potential here. So it's pretty cool to see like interoperability amongst platforms in the space and how the synergies can you know one plus one can equal three or more it doesn't just have to be two so that's that's really cool it's really nice to meet you dr joy um if people want to get a hold of you your linkedin is okay underneath yeah absolutely or you can shoot our team an email at hello at pluto.health mm. um hello at pluto.health if you're a site they're not going to give you studies, right? Don't spam her. And uh, <laughs> uh, that that's the email if you're interested. And then LinkedIn, I'll put Dr. Joy's LinkedIn underneath as well. And then Raymond as well, his LinkedIn's underneath. Um, thank you guys both for coming on. This is a really cool partnership. I like to see this kind of stuff. And like Raymond said, you know, it just kind of came out of left field, but it's it makes sense. Once, once you establish this as like the new norm, it's just we're gonna think, well, why didn't we always just do this? Like it's just such common sense later, but I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes to even pull this off. So kudos to both of you guys for this. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Everybody go connect with Dr. Joy and Raymond. Like, subscribe, comment, share, and catch y'all later. Bye bye. <laughs>